Hi, today we're going to be talking about cognition, thinking, and intelligence. The field of study I went into at UC Irvine was actually called cognitive science. It represented a, an expansion of the way that experimental psychology handled looking into people's capabilities. It used to be that they would test only their ability to learn or their IQs, but they weren't really looking at sort of the internal processes that the brain could do, the, the mental gymnastics until sometime after humanistic psychology fell to the wayside and we began to look back at sort of human potentialities. The initial people who studied in the field of psychology took on uh, looking at introspection or, or what they themselves could do. And when cognitive psychology came around in the 60s, it really had to do a lot more with testing subjects in labs rather than just thinking about, you know how Ebbinghaus, when we studied memory, tested himself. Uh, they looked more into labs and they developed this idea about cognition. Cognition is basically just the mental activity that you use when you're thinking, when you're obtaining information, when you're modeling information, when you're using that information to solve problems that you don't know how to overcome the obstacles that you face. Thinking, on the other hand, is... Well, I, I like to think about thinking. Uh, it's a really cool task because you're utilizing the process to analyze the process. Uh, it's almost like learning about the brain. You're using your brain to learn about the brain. In thinking about thinking, we have the colloquial phrase, which means just basically a, a, a ubiquitous conscious mental process that is just your, your consciousness, right? That's what you think thinking really is. Yet thinking in a clinical sense, when we study thinking or people's ability to think, it has to do with being able to move from one mental state to another, right? From, from a place where you don't know the solution to a problem to where you do understand it where you can overcome a mental obstacle and and succeed. There are a lot of things to think about these days. A lot of people like to think they're thinking, but really what they end up doing is not thinking. They end up purporting their own fixed set of beliefs rather than attempting to hone them or manipulate them. You may have heard the biblical phrase, iron sharpens iron. But that's the way I like to think about thinking, and that's a way that's helpful, especially if it's in a political context, where if you are on one side of the political spectrum, or you're, you're thinking, as you call it, I would say your ideology is on this swung out pendulum, far out, this is my right, probably your left, um, doesn't matter, right or left, or it's way out here, my left, your right. If you believe that that system of thought, the right or the left ideology surrounding how people should govern themselves and behave, if you think that the other side has nothing to say, you're not thinking. You are stuck dogmatically within your own ideology. True thinking takes both of these things, juxtaposed, weighing them in the balance, uh, like, like that classic statue in front of the courthouses, you know, holding, holding the balance, um, justice. If you think about a problem, you need to take two elements of yourself and split them off. One element of yourself has to argue for one side of a particular thing. The other element has to argue for another side. If it's a more complicated issue than a binary choice of, should I eat that ice cream cone or should I not eat that ice cream cone? You're going to have to be, uh, more nuanced than that. And it's a more complex and it's a cognitively very taxing task uh, to, to overcome. It's difficult to think. It takes up a lot of energy, mental energy, cognitive energy, um, psychic, if you will, energy. People don't really like to think. They like to have solutions to problems, right? I think of the story of the little red hen who wanted to bake bread and asked a bunch of people to help her. Nobody would help her. And so at the end, she didn't share that bread with them because, well, they didn't help. Similarly, if, if you want to think, it's worth the work. It's worth the end product of having deeply 
discussed within your own mind a particular topic. You become far greater of a conversation partner if you're capable of thinking broadly about something difficult. We have ways that we go about problem solving and making decisions, ways that are um, typical to people to think. And the first step that the book talks about is identifying that there's a problem, right? Saying, okay, here's an issue. Let's think about something difficult to solve. Let's say failing schools, okay? If you take failing schools, you have to say, is there a problem? And most of you, because you've been, you've been taught to say this, is that schools have failed. There are failing schools. Many of you think you went to schools that are failing schools. If you don't compete that idea with perhaps those schools aren't failing, you can't adequately address if this is something to consider. You might be shadow boxing, fighting an enemy that's not there. And that's a real waste of time. So it's important from the, from the outset to compete the idea of whether this is a problem or not. Maybe you haven't decided if it's a problem or not. Maybe you're just even worried about, is this something I could possibly attempt to solve? Your efficacy in whether or not you can solve the problem is something you should push off until after you've identified if there is a problem or not. Let's say we do the hard, difficult mental work and we come up with the conclusion, yes, there are schools that are failing. Well, if what we do is we take our, our own efficacy, our own ability to solve that problem, and we think, well, what can I do to help failing schools? What could I do to, um, how could we as a society help these failing schools? You think of the things that you have control over and you immediately want to start turning those no knobs, those, you know, so, so to speak, on the machine to see if there's going to be a different outcome in the end. And if there's not going to be a different outcome, why are you doing it? So sometimes you need to be thinking about as you try to solve the problem, if, if this works the way I think it will work, what will be the outcome? Rather than just turning knobs wildly, another thing is problematic in problem solving is that if this is a complex issue, like say a failing school, and you turn three knobs at once with three different programs, and all of a sudden you get, hey, there it is, we fixed the problem. You know, you might not be able to, I'm trying to fix the focus here. You might not be able to discern which of those three solutions was the one that was helpful at solving your problem. So, identifying the problem, seeing if it's a problem that's worthy of solution, seeing if it's a simple or a complex problem. These are all thought processes to take and people take these with all sorts of problems. But let's go back to our analogy about these failing schools. Let's say we incentivize teachers, right? We say, okay, what we're gonna do is we're going to make you a person who's completing a very difficult cognitive task of training young people we're gonna make you financially benefiting if your students start succeeding more on say a standardized test. If we turn that and we say, okay, well see, this is what it is, is we're gonna get teachers to do a better job. And we haven't really thought about our potential solution to that. We haven't seen well, what, when we shift the knob of paying a teacher more for a better outcome, what else might that do? Might that not help them teach the children in a better way? Are they capable of teaching better? Can you take one teacher who's a, say, failing teacher, and can you incentivize them to perform better? There's a great video that you guys will watch. I think I'll probably show it uh, during this time. and. It's going to be about what motivates people. And I'll show it now, even though we're not in the motivation part, because it has to do with something about financial incentives to increase cognitive performance. And what we see is that beyond rudimentary tasks like moving rocks from one section to another, something physically you could do better uh, by effort, when you get to a cognitive task that's a dynamic or complex one, like, say, 
taking a child from one place intellectually and cognitively, academically to a more advanced place, that is very complex. And when we increase the incentives financially for remuneration for those people in charge of that teaching and learning, what we find is the opposite of what you would expect. The pay for, for performance scheme doesn't work in that setting. Thinking is difficult, and so we try to simplify it. We try to use things called heuristics or algorithms of if this is not working anymore like I thought it was, what can I do to overcome that problem? Let's say your car, driving down the street, hopefully you don't drive much right now because we're in lockdown. But it, let's say you're not in lockdown. Let's say you're driving down the street in your car. That's the engine um, failing. Let's say your car engine fails. What is the first thing that goes through your mind? First thing you might think of is, well, I don't know what's wrong. Second thing that might go through your mind is, I can't figure out what's wrong. The third thing that might go through your mind is, I have to figure out what's going wrong. And because I can't, I need help. You might call AAA. Okay. If you're somebody like me who likes to think they're more competent at fixing things than they actually are, you might start down a, an algorithm, a way of solving the problem of getting your car to start. Ways that you've used before to start your car will be the first choices you go to. My dad always says, when people fail at a task, they revert to the last thing that they were successful at in a similar type situation. So if I've been in a situation where my car failed before, I'm gonna go back to the solution that worked last time to solve that same problem. I remember I had a car that, um, that it was a, it's this old beat up Volkswagen and it often would break. And so I would find myself when it would break, I would try the last thing that I had tried that got it started last time first. This is an algorithm, this is a system, a way, a heuristic to, to go through and, and, and solve that problem step by step using the most efficient way. But every time I found that that old solution didn't work this time, that formula or set of rules I had used before, that algorithm I had employed failed me when I was into a new problem. A heuristic is a problem solving shortcut. Now you might use a heuristic like what to do in a thunderstorm. That's what the book says. In a thunderstorm, you're supposed to always figure out how far you are from the thunder by, you know, that rule of one second per lightning flash to sound is going to tell you how many miles away. It's not exactly that, but depending on the climate, depending on the, your elevation, it's, it's, it's different in different situations. The speed of sound changes when you, when you go higher, but let's say you're at sea level. And let's say you see a flash of lightning and then you start counting one, two, three, four, five. And you get to five before you hear the <laughs> that thunder. That means you're about five miles away from that thunderstorm. Um, and so it gives you a little bit of estimate of how you're going to need to change your behavior. If you're out in the middle of an open field, the heuristic is, okay, so how do I simplify my problem so I get to the the place where I can be safe. And you say, oh, well, there's an, you know, an overpass, you know, a mile away. Let me head towards that overpass so that I can be safe in this thunderstorm. The heuristic is that basic guideline for getting you there. You say you're lost in the forest um, and you don't have a compass or, you know, there's no cell phone um, coverage. One of the heuristic you can use is uh, to look at uh, the moss growing on the north side of trees. What if you're in a forest with no moss? See, not every heuristic is always going to uh, help you identify where you are, but generally, they're general rules that help us to get there. Some people have problems thinking and functioning because they can't overcome what we call functional fixedness. Now, functional fixedness is a problem where we get into a mindset that we can't break out of our previous set of rules to overcome a new set of rules, to overcome a new obstacle with, with expanding that set of rules that we had before, the heuristic, that sort of rule of thumb that got us to where we needed to go, 
We need to expand our heuristic when we find a problem that we can't solve anymore. A classic one is uh, the nine dot problem. All right, so here are nine dots. Your task is to, you can, you can draw this out on a piece of paper and do this if you will. You've probably not seen this before, maybe you have. If you have, don't ruin it for people next to you or, or maybe let them try. Uh, so these nine dots, you need to connect them using four lines. The lines must be straight and connecting, meaning that once you put your pencil down to draw the lines, you may not pick it up again until four lines are drawn. Those four lines must connect all nine dots. Okay, here's your task, right? How are you going to solve... Oh, let me see here. Oops. How are you going to solve that problem? How are you going to get through something that it seems difficult, right? You might go through a trial and error method, where you start making lines and you go line, oh wait, line, 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 line. Oh, that was four lines and I still have these two dots unconnected. All right, line, line, line. Oh, I'm missing that one. You're gonna have to do some real problem solving. When you meet this, this grid of nine dots, sorry, it's a little windy out here. You're gonna find yourself stuck. You find yourself stuck in a place where you don't know how to go about solving the problem using the set of tools you have. Working within the bounds that you have been given or those that you even self-impose. In fact, in this case, it's often that you just fail to think outside the box before you can solve that problem. But don't worry, if you can't solve this problem, you're like most people. Because you can't really solve this problem, this cognitive, there is a solution to this problem. I'm not, I, I hate those people that give unsolvable problems. That's really annoying. But there's a solution to this problem. And again, it's just, you, you, you haven't seen it before. You've never been encountered with this. And so you can't think outside the box and you can't solve this problem. You're like most people. Some of you, however, just experienced something where you did, you were capable of solving that problem with the parameters you were given. And you went, oh, I have insight. I have a, a way that I can solve this problem now because I was able to think outside the box. Sorry for lack of a better term, but it's a really good one here. Um, you developed an aha. See, if you sit there and you stare at those nine dots and you just keep staring and you just keep going through the same problem solving heuristics that you've used in the past to solve problems like this, trial and error being the main one, right? That's fine. You have plenty. You, you don't have to solve this problem right now. You can play around with it. In fact, that's what I encourage you to do is to take those nine dots and just keep sitting with it. Keep pushing through. This is a good lesson for life. Thinking and persistence together equal success, not just sort of thinking. We'll get to intelligence in a bit, which has a basically a measurement of your ability to think creatively about novel problems that you just saw, like this nine dot problem. Don't be upset if you don't fix it right away, if you don't know the answer. This is a hard problem. Most people can't get this one. So you and I are like most people and we don't get this on the first try, but it can be solved. So you need a little bit of persistence. Let me tell you a story. Story is of Ar Archimedes. Archimedes was working for a king. He was a, a scientist of his day. There wasn't science back then, so an inventor right? Um, if you're familiar with the great uh, myths of the Greeks, you might know Daedalus, right? He was like a modern day or a modern, a real time Daedalus. He, he was brought to the king and the king presented him a problem. Here's a problem. See, he had given a gold bar to his goldsmith and the goldsmith was charged with crafting a, a golden crown for the king. And when he came back, When he came back, the, the crown, the king thought, felt really light compared to the gold bar that had been given to the goldsmith. And the king was under suspicion that this goldsmith was, you know, cutting a little off to the side and, and taking a little of the gold for himself. That frustrated the king, and the king didn't know how to solve a problem, but he knew that his buddy Archimedes, not buddy, this guy who worked for him, was a good thinker. And so he said, Archimedes, come here, I got, I got something for you. 
you figure out if the gold bar that I gave the goldsmith is the same, right, because it came in this big fat bar and the goldsmith melted it down and crafted it into a bigger crown, you find out if that's the same amount of gold that I gave the goldsmith or if he's cheated me. And he said, one of the two of you is going to die. Either you figure out if he cheated me or you figure, or he, or you die, right? So he put a lot of pressure on Archimedes and this freaked Archimedes out. Kings could do this. They could take people's lives, you know. Um, they had sovereignty. That's why we call them sovereigns. Um, Archimedes, his name, you know, obviously he's stressed out. So he goes back to his lab, goes to his house, starts working on the problem. Working and working and working. And he just can't come up with the solution. And he's stressed because he knows that his life's on the line. If he doesn't solve this, the king's going to kill him. This is terrible. He's he's frustrated and anxious. He doesn't want to die. You know, But he just can't solve this problem, right? Because the crown and the bar are way the same. He just couldn't figure out how to figure out if that goldsmith had duped the king. Finally, he has to go back and report to the king, let's say the next day. He's exhausted. You've been there. You've been trying to solve a problem. You feel exhausted. You can't solve it. He decides to save his family, you know, the, the trouble of having to dress his body after his death, he kind of resigns to, hey, you know what, I'm going to put my affairs in order, I'm going to go take a bath and prepare my body for death so that my family won't have to do that, you know, save them one thing. I can at least do that, I can bathe myself. People didn't bathe a lot in the bath back in, then, in the day, so he goes and fills up a bath mindlessly, he's stressed, he's depressed, he's scared to die, but he finally gives in and goes, okay. So I'm going to die. I've accepted that fate. I can't solve this problem. I'm going to go sit in a bath and wash my body and prepare it for death. As he steps in the tub that he's filled for himself, as he, his body, goes into that tub, the water comes up and spills out over the sides. And he yells, Eureka! which you might know of as a town that's got a big meth problem in Northern California, but, but in his language it means, I found it. It's, I got it. I did it. I win. Victory. What he meant was, his insight, that moment of Eureka, came after he'd gone away from trying to solve the problem. It wasn't in the arena where he was trying to solve the problem. His brain needed to relax to investigate new ways to break out of his functional fixedness of, well, they weigh the same, the crown and the, the bar weigh the same. But what he figured out is the displacement of the water represents the object's mass compared to the volume. You could then use that to see, was this gold crown the same amount of gold in that gold bar? By how much water do they displace? And he did that and he found out the goldsmith was cheating him. Goldsmith, you know, he's no, no longer with us. And I'm telling you a story about Archimedes thousands of years later. He, Archimedes also invented the water screw. Basically, it's a screw that you put in a tube and then you can make water, you, you turn it and then water will come up out of it. So it's a mechanism for hydraulics. He, Archimedes made that too, so there you go. Um, his insight came when he walked away from the problem. And so many times this is exactly what needs to happen. If you get frustrated, if you're sitting there banging your head against the proverbial wall, if you can't think outside the box, you need to go away from that problem. Go away from the problem. Don't prepare yourself for death, but go away from the problem and allow your mind to wander. Allow it to do that because it, it has ways of solving problems when it moves away because it can incorporate more disparate areas. It can help you think outside the box. I keep saying that um, because that's what you have to do. So often we have these schemas of seeing things in our world. So often we have these stereotypes that we use that are very good for us in most situations. People are like, oh, don't stereotype. Yeah, yeah, do. The world is far too big and far too complex for you 
to not stereotype. If you're a bigot, that's that's a different thing. If you're a bigot, that means that you have taken personal experiences that violate those stereotypes and you fail to incorporate them into your own life. If you don't know or don't have experience, don't say anything. But if you do know and you do have experience and it's different from what those stereotypical things would be, you probably are, are not utilizing your knowledge well. You're not using your cognitive abilities well. So many examples of people who have insight, people who develop new things, they are people that don't think like others. So don't be somebody who's thinking constantly like everyone else. Be a person who has your uniqueness to add to the scenario. Your uniqueness is something that's good and can be useful. You have a good idea. Um, I tell my stats class, uh, the first paper that I got published, oh, I got to be first author. It wasn't because I came up with the research idea. It wasn't because I was the best researcher on the team. It wasn't because I did the most work, although I did do a lot of work. It was because I had the fundamental insight. And that insight wasn't because I was smarter than people on the team. There's far smarter people than me on that research team. The reason that I succeeded in that scenario was that I persisted. I persisted thinking about it. When others stopped thinking about it, when we ran into a wall, we ran into an obstacle, people stopped thinking about it, and I didn't. Um, you might call me a stubborn or, or uh, you know, maybe I don't know when to quit. But in that sense, persistence of thinking gave me insight. And that insight allowed me to solve a problem other people couldn't solve, and I, I discovered something. So now we know that there is a seasonality of birth in Alzheimer's disease, and you can go read a paper that I wrote about that. I think it was in like 2005. A long time ago since I've published stuff like that. But you have the ability to do it. And it's not just that you're not a good thinker, or you're not gifted or talented as they put you in some program in school. Persistence is the key. Persistence is the key. So keep with it, you can solve problems. Next one we're gonna talk about is intelligence because you don't know what it is, you misunderstand it, it gets a bad name, and there are differences between people and intelligence. I'm gonna tell you all these things and we'll explain why you don't have to be mad at IQ tests. They are actually very useful. Um, but you should remember the thing I just said about stereotyping. We do it because it helps us to take in a complex world. But it's not bad to do. It's bad to do when you have an experience to ignore those experiences and incorporating them into your heuristics, incorporating them into your set of uh, algorithms that can solve problems. You know, if you think, um, you know, I don't know, uh, some, some bigoted thing. Women, women can't fight. And so you go and you, you're gonna attack a woman, but you attack Ronda Rousey. You pick the wrong woman, she can fight. She'll destroy you. You pick Cyborg, she'll kill you. But your stereotype of women don't fight as well as men may have been true until you run into that scenario where, yeah, yeah, they can. 